Hello, and welcome to this presentation, Understanding Spacewire. In this presentation, we'll provide a short technical introduction to the Spacewire protocol, how it's used in modern applications, and how Spacewire signals are decoded and analyzed using an oscilloscope. Instruments in modern spacecraft can generate very large amounts of digital data at very high data rates. For example, high-resolution cameras, different types of radar, etc. This data usually needs to be moved between a source and some kind of mass memory device, and this has to be done in an efficient way. Although this is something of a solved problem for terrestrial applications, operating in space introduces a number of special challenges. Clearly, small size and low weight, or rather mass, are important, and low power consumption is also highly desirable. Furthermore, the system needs to be both radiation resistant and fault tolerant. Having a standard way of transferring data is also helpful for the purpose of interoperability, especially because modern spacecraft often contain components from many different manufacturers. Spacewire, published by the European Cooperation for Space Standardization, is the predominant protocol used for data transfer in spacecraft, and the most recent version was released in 2019. Spacewire has been designed into hundreds of missions by all the major space agencies, including NASA, the ESA, JAXA, and Roscosmos, and this protocol is used in both scientific and commercial vehicles. Spacewire was developed specifically for use in spacecraft in order to provide a standard communication protocol, and Spacewire helps address many of the special space-related challenges that we mentioned on the previous slide. Before we get into details, let's first provide a general technical overview of Spacewire. Spacewire provides full duplex bidirectional communications at speeds of approximately 2 to 200 megabits per second. Bits are encoded using LVDS, or Low Voltage Differential Signaling, and there are two signals in each direction, data and strobe. These signals are carried over cables containing four pairs of conductors plus a shield. Special link initialization and error detection slash recovery procedures help to enhance resiliency. User data is sent in the form of characters and packets with a very simple format and the connection between spacewire nodes can be made either via point-to-point -point links or via routers. And in addition to user data, control and time or synchronization data can also be transferred. In the remainder of this presentation, we'll cover these and other spacewire topics in much more technical detail. We'll begin with Low Voltage Differential Signaling, or LVDS. LVDS is often used for applications that need high speed, but which also need both low power consumption and low noise. The differential part of LVDS has the advantage that it improves immunity to external noise and also helps to reduce noise radiated by the system itself. The low voltage part of LVDS refers to the relatively small voltage swing with respect to ground. In the case of Spacewire, this swing is approximately 350 millivolts. Note that low voltage in turn means low power. If the receiver has a terminal resistance of 100 ohms, then the resulting current is only about plus or minus 3.5 milliamps, with a positive current being a logical one and a negative current being a logical zero. Next we'll look at cabling. Spacewire cables contain four twisted pairs, each carrying a differential signal. Each of these pairs is shielded, and the entire cable also has its own shield. The construction of this cable causes it to have a characteristic impedance of approximately 100 ohms. Maximum cable length is 10 meters, and this is usually sufficient for most spacecraft. But routers or repeaters can also be used to extend this maximum length. In most cases, these cables are terminated in a 9-pin micro-miniature D-type connector, with 8 pins assigned to the 4 differential pairs, and 1 pin connected to the shield. Note that shielding each pair of cables helps to avoid crosstalk between them, which also helps in meeting the EMC requirements for spacecraft. The 8 signal-carrying conductors of a spacewire link are used to carry 4 differential signals, 
One of these differential pairs carries so-called data signals in one direction, and another differential pair transmits so-called strobe signals in the same direction. We'll discuss data strobe encoding in much more detail on the next slide. The individual wires are sometimes called data plus, data minus, strobe plus, and strobe minus. The other two pairs are used to transmit data and strobe in the opposite direction. Remember that all space wire links are bidirectional. That is, signals can flow simultaneously in both directions between the nodes. Now let's explain data strobe encoding. In data strobe encoding, the strobe signal changes state whenever the data signal remains constant over consecutive bit times. Another way of saying this is that at each bit time, either the data signal or the strobe signal must change state, but never both at the same time. For example, if this is the data signal, we see that there are several bit periods during which the signal does not change state. The strobe signal therefore changes state whenever the data signal does not, that is here, here, and here. If we perform an exclusive OR operation on these two signals, the result is a synchronous clock. Another advantage of data strobe encoding is that it allows almost an entire bit time of skew between the data and strobe signals, which is important for high-speed serial data transfer. The bits on a space wire link are organized into characters, and these characters are grouped into two categories, data characters and control characters. Next, we'll spend a few minutes covering both of these kinds of characters, including how they're formatted and how they're used. A data character is 8 bits long, transmitted least significant bit first. These data bits are preceded by two non-data bits. The first of these is the parity bit, which is used for detecting bit errors. The next bit is the data control flag, which is set to zero to indicate that this is a data rather than a control character. Data characters are primarily used to transfer data information, that is, user data, but they're also used to encode the destination address of a routed packet. We'll come back to routing a bit later in this presentation. The other type of character is control characters, which are 4 bits long and which are also transmitted least significant bit first. All control characters start with a parity bit for error detection, and the data control flag is set to 1 to indicate a control character. Recall that this bit was set to 0 to indicate a data character. After these two bits, there is a 2-bit control code that specifies the character type. Two of these characters, escape and the flow control token, are used for link management. We'll cover both of these in more detail shortly. The other two are used to signal the end of a packet. These are the normal end of packet and the error end of packet. Before we cover how control characters are used, let's first explain what we mean by a packet. Packets are composed of data characters and may begin with a destination address which is either the address of, or the path to, the destination node. Note that on direct point-to-point -point links between nodes, this field is not needed. The cargo field contains one or more characters of user data, that is the useful data exchanged between space wire nodes. This field can be of any length, and its contents are not defined by the standard. In order to indicate the end of a correctly and completely transmitted packet, the end of packet character is appended to the cargo data. If, however, the packet were interrupted or truncated during transmission, the error end of packet is used instead. This indicates to the receiver that the cargo is incomplete and that the data within the cargo may be errored. Now let's come back to control codes. The escape control character can be used to create two longer control codes. The first of these is the null code. As we'll see on the next slide, this null code is used both to initialize the link as well as to detect link disconnection. That is, nulls are transmitted to keep the link alive. The second control character is the time code. This code is used for synchronization and time distribution, 
a topic we'll cover in just a few moments. But let's first walk through link initialization. Spacewire has a link initialization process that must be performed before data can be sent. Links are considered inactive or idle when both the data and the strobe signals are low. This process is also used to reinitialize the link after various types of errors, such as when a parity error is detected. The initialization procedure is very simple. One side, we'll call it side A, sends nulls to the other side. This side, side B, synchronizes to these nulls and sends nulls back to side A. Side A then synchronizes with the nulls it received from side B. Once this has occurred, both sides can then begin sending each other so-called flow control tokens. Flow control is a process that ensures that data is not sent to a receiver unless that receiver is both ready and able to receive it. This prevents buffer overflow and data loss at the receiver. Flow control is implemented using the flow control token control character that we introduced earlier. These are sent from the receiver to the transmitter with each token representing the ability to receive eight data characters. Multiple tokens can be sent. For example, four tokens means that 32 data characters may be sent, and there can be up to seven outstanding tokens. Note that since space wire links are bidirectional, flow control tokens are sent independently in both directions. In addition to initialization and flow control, SpaceWire also uses control codes to distribute time information to all nodes on the network, with resolution in the single nanosecond range. This is done by sending time codes, which encode an incrementing tick that synchronize to spacecraft time. These time codes are made up of an escape control character, followed by a single data character. After the standard two leading bits, this data character contains a 6-bit time count in bits 0 to bits 5, as well as two control flags in bits 6 and 7. These last two bits are, however, always set to 0. Our final topic is topologies. Nodes in a space wire network can be connected using either point-to-point -point links and or by using special nodes called routers. Over the next few slides, we'll explain these two types of connections and how they're used. Point-to-point -point links are the simplest and most common type of connection used in SpaceWire. In this arrangement, nodes are directly connected to each other via a single link. Since there is only one path between nodes, the destination address field is not needed in packets exchanged over this type of connection. The greatest advantages of point-to-point -point links are simplicity and low power consumption. There's also no possibility of contention or blocking, since each node has exclusive access to the link. However, point-to-point -point links lack flexibility and are not inherently fault tolerant. A failure of a single link connection will prevent the nodes from communicating. That said, nodes may be configured with multiple point-to-point -point links between them. Multiple links not only provide redundancy, but also enable load sharing between the nodes. Nodes can also be connected via routers. A router has multiple link interfaces and a switch matrix, and this arrangement allows any nodes connected to the router to exchange information. Another way of saying this is that a router transfers incoming packets from one link to another. Routing has the advantages of providing both architectural flexibility as well as improved reliability in the case where there are multiple links or paths to a destination. Disadvantages of using routers are that they consume power and can lead to block packets. They may also be a single point of failure. Routers use the packet's destination address to determine which link, or rather which exit port, the incoming packet should be routed to. There are, however, two ways of using the destination address. These are path addressing and logical addressing. Let's look more closely at each of these. In path addressing, the destination address is a series of data characters, with each character showing which router exit port is to be used for each router on the path to the destination. Each router strips the leading character as it passes through that router. 
This is sometimes referred to as header deletion. For example, in this network, a packet arrives with a three-character destination address. The first character is 12, so the router switches this packet to link 12 and removes the leading data character. At the next router, the process is repeated. The leading data character 7 is stripped off as the packet is routed to that exit port. This continues again at the next router until only the data portion of the packet remains and is delivered to the destination node. Note that routers can only have up to 31 external ports, so the data characters in the path address must be in the range of 0 to 31. Note too that when using path addressing, the routers do not require any kind of internal routing table. All of the information necessary to route packets is encoded in the packet header. In logical addressing, only a single data character is used for the destination address, and this address is not deleted as the packet passes through a router. Each router has its own internal routing table that it uses to determine the exit port for a given destination address. For example, in this network, each router has its own routing table. As a packet moves through the network, each router looks at the destination address and then maps this to an exit port. Note that in the case of logical addressing, destination addresses must be in the range of 32 to 255. This avoids any ambiguity or confusion with path addressing, in which the destination addresses are always in the range of 0 to 31. Before we conclude this presentation, let's take a minute to discuss how spacewire links can be analyzed and decoded using an oscilloscope. Since spacewire uses differential links, in most cases, differential probes are used. Two channels are needed, one for the data signal and one for the strobe signal. Oscilloscopes can provide a great deal of information about a spacewire link, including decoding of packets, measurements of the electrical properties of the signal, such as timing or slew rate, as well as information regarding the timing of protocol and non-protocol events. With regards to message decoding, triggering on or filtering spacewire characters or packets based on message type or message content is also a helpful feature. Many scopes also allow results to be viewed per character and or in table format and also allow the results to be exported in a variety of file formats. Let's end with a brief summary. Spacewire is a bi-directional serial data protocol that was designed to meet the challenges of operating in space. Four differential wire pairs are used to carry two signals, data and strobe, in both directions. Bits are sent in the form of data or control characters with data characters typically being organized into larger packets. Spacewire also supports the broadcasting of time information for synchronization. Links in Spacewire must be initialized and are continually monitored for errors. Flow control is used to ensure that incoming data does not overflow the received buffers. Nodes are connected either point to point or via routers. And finally, oscilloscopes can be used to decode and analyze spacewire characters and packets. This concludes our presentation, Understanding Spacewire. If you'd like to learn more about serial protocols, how they're decoded, or about oscilloscopes from Brody and Schwartz, please see the links in the video description. Thanks for watching. Please subscribe to our YouTube channel and visit us at rody-schwartz.com.